Welcome to the Stock Talk Investor Podcast. This video podcast is part of our CEO interview series, where our mission is to help listeners and investors understand more about investment opportunities in the public marketplace. I'm Dave Jackson. It often seems that the pace of technological change gets exponentially faster, almost by the minute. Immersive virtual worlds for both entertainment and enterprise, ever more realistic and exciting real-time digital media production, competitive esports, artificial intelligence, and big data analysis, all are multi-billion dollar sectors in their own right, and all of these things demand ever-increasing amounts of computer processing power. Our featured company this week is Amped Ventures, Inc. Trading on the Canadian Stock Exchange under the symbol AMPD is a company headquartered in Vancouver, BC, Canada, that's pioneering a new kind of internet that copes with the demands of these next generation applications through their high performance at the edge approach to digital infrastructure. We're excited to be joined today by AMP CEO, Anthony Brown, a 20 year veteran of the high performance computing sector to find out more about AMP and his vision to reinvent the internet. Anthony, thank you for joining us today, sir. Thanks very much for having me, Dave. Uh, first, Anthony, tell me a bit about Ampt and you know, what made you decide to want to start this company first off? Well, I guess the first thing that happened was we could easily identify that there were problems with the current commodity cloud. So just, just the way that the cloud works, when it applies to things like rendering, um, eSports, anything that was an interactive application, it just, it just didn't run as well as it should. Mm -hmm. uh, and then because of the expertise we've had over the last 20 years, um, so like this all starts with a company called Seven Group. Uh, Seven Group started back in 2000 and between 2004, 2011, uh, we probably had somewhere around 70% market share uh, for digital media content creation. So that was building all the compute infrastructure for digital media studios, animation, visual effects, and video game studios. Okay. Um, having done that, and then actually my uh, CTO, we jointly started a company called IGP, Infinite Game Publishing, and we published a, a game called Mech Warrior Online, which, by the way, was one of the first multiplayer esports games. Um, and so we had to run that infrastructure for ourselves and something that the, the public was interacting with, and it was a very latency-sensitive game. So having seen those two things, having built out the, the infrastructure for building content and then having run the content ourselves, mm -hmm. really gave us a pretty deep insight into the areas in which kind of commodity cloud just didn't address the right market. So uh, the last part of it was our, CS, our, our, our um, CSO. So James Hursthouse um, uh, ran a company called Online Game Services Inc. like back in 2004, something like that. And he was one of the guys who was the first, one of the first hosting companies for hosting multiplayer uh, online video games. Sure. Uh, and so, you know, between us, we felt that not only could we see the problem, we could address it. Anthony, esports and video games, virtual worlds, big data processing, machine learning, you know, that seems to be a very broad focus for a relatively new company. Well, it can be seen that way, um, but the reality is, is that high performance computing at the edge, what we do really just happens to apply across a lot of different sectors. Um, it applies to, as you mentioned, esports, machine learning, virtual reality, any application that's very high, needs like very high performance processing and, or is very, very lat latency sensitive. You know, Commodity Cloud was designed originally to do things like e-commerce. It wasn't designed to do this sort of work. And so, as it turns out, as all the applications um, for Industry 4.0, uh, for various different forms of digital media roll out, um, they all happen to require this type of infrastructure. So, we're starting to see it come across and, you know, COVID-19, you know, has been an unfortunate catalyst for, you know, some of the things that we're seeing happen out there. But, you know, things like virtual concerts, for example, um, everybody, you know, telecommunicating uh, just like we're doing right now, you know, um, that virtual presence and those virtual worlds are really starting to develop. And that requires a different type of infrastructure. So, you know, 
when we see things like in, in the case of virtual production, we're seeing the advent of game technology coming into to animation and visual effects. They're using like game engines, the same, same things they use to make video games on your console to make movies and, and visual effects. And that's because they can render things mm -hmm. in real time, right? So, you know, a good example, our friends over at Lifelike and Believable um, are able to take live circus performers, capture them with a mocap system and put them into a, a metaverse of a virtual world, right? So that virtual world allows everybody in the world to be able to come and watch this. Like, a, and, and, and this applies to things like virtual concerts. It applies to things like virtual classrooms, but that ability to take a real world, you know, person or object, put it into the metaverse and then serve it out to the world is really a, a big example of what we're seeing right now with, with the impact of COVID-19. Uh, kind of like uh, in Ready Player One, right? Yeah, I mean, hopefully not quite as dystopian, uh, but really this idea of this multiplayer virtual reality video game evolving into a place where you know humans can 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 do business, can communicate, can can carry on relationships. You know, it it is something that is very likely to happen. Mm -hmm. And as all of these various different technologies converge from Industry 4.0, digital media, animation, visual effects, all those different technologies converge together. We're going to, you know, basically slowly develop this idea of a metaverse, this oasis. And, you know, basically, we want to be that infrastructure, the, the picks and shovels of the oasis, if you will. Excellent. Now, maybe for some of our, you know, less tech savvy viewers out there, you could spend a minute or so just explaining some of the basic concepts of high performance computing, uh, why the current internet just doesn't cut it, and, you know, how AMP's approach is different. Well, really, it boils down to that word latency that I brought up a few times now. So latency is essentially, you know, the amount of time measured in milliseconds that it takes a piece of data to go from my laptop or my, my mobile phone to the server in the cloud, get process, and then the results of that processing coming back to my PC. So that's impacted by two main things, and that's kind of how we address latency is, is by two ways. One, just the distance you are away from that server. You know, the, the further away you are, the longer it takes for the data to travel back and forth. And if you have a lot of, you know, hops on the internet that you have to go through to get from point A to point B, that kind of geographic distance impacts latency. So what we do is we build our data centers in urban centers, and then we directly fiber attach the end user right to the servers. So they're not going over the internet, they're not going very far away, they can directly attach to that, to that server and that mitigates latency and that's kind of the at the edge part. The high performance computing part of it, that's basically the, the, the architecture, the way that the servers work. Mm -hmm. So the, the commodity cloud companies out there, they, you know, blossomed out from, you know, things like e-commerce, you know, Amazon had the big Black Friday and Christmas sales. And now what are we going to do with all these servers when everybody's done buying all their stuff? Well, let's write them out. Uh, and that was kind of the birth of Amazon Web Services as, as an example. And that approach, that commodity cloud approach uses commodity equipment. Uh, it uses software to handle all the networking and security. Uh, all the, the data actually resides in the servers. And so sometimes one server has to talk to another server to mm -hmm. get the data to do the processing. And when you combine all those things together, you add, add a bunch of latency when communicating with the servers. In our case, we use what's called a high performance compute architecture. And very simply, we just do everything in hardware. So it's faster. We do all the networking, all the firewalling, everything else using actual hardware. So things run at what we refer to as wire speed. Right. Then we separate the data from all the servers and supply the data to the servers at blazing fast speeds using our special storage system, which is actually part of the announcement uh, that we made recently ar around Intel. So that ability to be able to run a high performance compute architecture combined with that high performance computing architecture being in an urban center at the edge is how we mitigate latency and how we solve the problems that come from the kind of standard community, the mm -hmm. commodity cloud approach. So Anthony, I read a recent uh, press release uh, through which you announced that real estate developer, Stephen Hines, 
had joined your advisory board. Uh, can you tell us a bit about, more about that? Absolutely. So, um, Stephen's, you know, the first impact that we saw from that partnership with Stephen was uh, DC1. Our data center is housed in a building that Stephen designed 20 years ago with the thought in mind to actually take a data center and make it the heart of the building. In fact, he wanted to capture the heat generated by the servers to heat the surrounding building. Now, you know, over the years, he rented it out, didn't actually have a, a data center tenant in there that really truly made use of it all until AMP came along. And when we moved in, we really saw a huge opportunity. So we know that we have to put that high performance computer architecture at the edge. We have to put them in urban centers. And Stephen's vision around how to capture the heat from the servers, how to generate clean drinking water from the air conditioning systems, you know, how to make a data center green and actually part of a resilient community was very key in, in that partnership. So that bringing Stephen on really allowed us to develop this technology to end up with data centers that can be harmoniously integrated into urban environments and allow us to put that compute right at the edge where the end users need it. And, you know, so number one, I mentioned the, the, the capture of the heat, which is great in the wintertime. In the summertime, for example, we use the water that's generated from that uh, air conditioning system and it's the waterfall feature that you can see in front of the building. We bring in the ambient air into the data center in the summertime from right beside that waterfall. So even in the summer that ambient air is cooled off by that. So it's, it's you know, really thinking through how to most efficiently use, you know, all the things that, that, um, that we can to make these data centers you know, really more part of what's involved in, say, like a smart city. Well, that's amazing stuff. Now, can you explain how all of this translates into revenue and real value for the company? Absolutely. So probably the easiest way to do this would be to use an example of a customer that we've already announced, uh, Bardell Entertainment. And, and if I remember correctly, you mentioned that uh, you knew the founders of Bardell? I did indeed. In fact, I still know them. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, well, they, they, you know, Bardell's been around Vancouver for I don't know how many years now, uh, but recently they've been having some really great success. Um, they they just announced uh, uh, the winning a daytime Emmy for uh, their cartoon uh, Dragon Prince, and what AMP does mm. is we do the rendering for Bardell. So the, 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 the rendering for the Dragon Prince and Rick and Morty and all that sort of stuff runs on app servers in our data center. Can you explain rendering to the lay person who may be on the other side of the microphone here? Uh, sure. Really what it is, is you have a whole bunch of artists that are all working on their computers, doing modeling, rigging, compositing, lighting, and building the digital representation of this animated show. All of that data has to be rendered, has to be gathered and put together into frames, which then can then be played for either a television show or a movie. So that process of gathering all of those different pieces of data together mm -hmm. and making it into a single frame, you know, you need 24 frames a second uh, for it to be able to, to catch the, the human eye. That that process that they go through is rendering. And it takes a lot of compute power to take all of that data and render it down into a frame. And that's where we come in. Mm -hmm. Well, then why won't Amazon and Google just realize what you guys are up to and do it themselves, amongst others? Well, you know, first of all, I always say that if your business plan has you having to beat Amazon to be successful, you should probably relook at the business plan. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, secondly, there, there's a, you know, because Amazon and Google and, 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 uh, Microsoft and so on are so large, people lose sight of the fact that there's, there's dozens of billion dollar market cap, uh, cloud companies out there. They're not the only ones in the market. Lastly, we've been able to compete against those hyperscalers very well. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we're less expensive than them and we're building a bespoke tailored environment for our customers that do things that commodity cloud just doesn't do well. So things like render, things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, virtual reality, all of those things, esports especially, all of those things uh, just, just don't want, run well on commodity cloud. And 
do run well on high performance computing at the edge. So, you know, maybe one day uh, as all of the applications start to require that kind of compute power, Amazon will, uh, you know, be looking at us as a good acquisition. No, no doubt. Now, 2020 has been a bit of a tough year. How has it been for you so far, Anthony? And, you know, obviously challenging for many other companies as well. You know, there, there has been its challenges and, you know, um, so with, we'll get to the obvious impact of COVID and, and COVID-19 has had an impact on uh, Unamped somewhat in a positive way just because of the type of work that we do. But let me go back to, to 2020 first of all, or to, sorry, to 2019 first of all. Um, 2019 was kind of a year of transition for us. We were taking the company from these point sale, one-time sales. They may have been big numbers. You know, we may do a deal that's a you know, million dollars worth of, of, of gear, but we were just basically selling that equipment to the end user and taking a very small margin on it. And what we did is we moved the company prior to going public into this cloud style, monthly recurring OPEX approach to computing. Now, you know, think about the value of those contracts. We get a contract with, with uh, you know, to sell, you know, a piece of gear for a million bucks, or we get a million bucks recurring every year with a lot higher margin. So obviously, you know, big impact and, and big positive impact on the value of the company and kind of the value to the shareholders for the company as well. So that transition, as well as building all the systems, bringing in the sales team, you know, uh, all of the different things were required to be able to truly launch the company, which is basically what we did when we went public and launched Bardell and launched all of those monthly recurring revenue customers. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we went, we, as much as we had slightly less revenue total for fiscal ending 2020, we increased our monthly recurring revenue tenfold. So, you know, that, that's a huge impact on the long term. For example, if we take Bardell Animation uh, as, as, as an example company, that's a three-year contract yeah. for us to render, uh, you know, their, their television shows on our equipment. And, and it, you know, it, think, think of it this way. It's, it's, um, you know, the value of that infrastructure lasts longer than the three-year contract, for example, that we have with, with Bardell. Mm -hmm. So because we're buying the latest and greatest in tech and our, the latest and greatest in CPUs and GPUs and all that fun blinky light stuff, we end up having gear that lasts at least five years, still has value for five years. So mm -hmm. after the three-year contract where we've totally amortized that equipment, we have another two years where the margins have just gone way up and it's not dependent on just Bardell using that equipment. Again, we have a ton of sectors we're able to address. And so the idea is to continually build up this infrastructure and be able to kind of measure the progress of the company by the number of cores, number, the amount of compute we have under management, which is, you know, kind of the way that you me measure kind of how well a cloud company is doing is how many cores have you got under management and how much, how, how many people do you have using them? When you take, you know, for example, a core runs somewhere around 10 to $15 uh, per core per month, as far as what you can generate in revenue, right? We generate between three and $5 in profit per core per month and gross profit. So the more cores you have, the more money you make, uh, and you know the more rendering we do, the more machine learning we do, the more virtual reality we do on those cores, the more you know. It, think of it as the you know this is a gold rush. Yeah, we have these applications that are that are coming out that everybody's excited about virtual reality and AI just for two of them, right? Mm -hmm. Can't wait for them to come. We're the guys in the hardware store selling the picks and shovels to be able to run that stuff. And that's basically what Abd is. Well, that is great stuff. Final question, Anthony, the million dollar one, why should people invest in Abd? Well, I can't say that they should invest in Abd because that would be a forward looking statement and then I would get in trouble. What I can say is we're addressing multi-billion dollar sectors with a unique product set without very much competition, with a team that's experienced and has done this before for the last 20 years, 
um, and in a revenue model that is monthly recurring and with high profits. I would just leave it to the uh, viewers to decide if, if that was something that they, they thought they might want to invest in. Awesome job. Thanks again for joining us, Anthony. My pleasure. Thanks very much. We, oh, we have been speaking with Amped Venture CEO, Anthony Brown. It's been great speaking with Anthony and understanding a little bit more about how Amped is rethinking the internet to be more compatible with the latest and greatest applications that we're all going to be enjoying in the years to come. You can also visit amped.tech for their investor hub to download a copy of their latest investor presentation. And you can also subscribe for the latest updates. Follow them on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. I'm Dave Jackson for Stockhouse Media and the Stock Talk Podcast. Thanks for watching.